All right, welcome to uh, the PulpCon session on multi-tenancy and some of the challenges that Pulp 3 has with multi-tenancy. Um, there's an agenda here uh, at the HackMD link uh, related to the um, entry in the schedule. And um, what it what I was hoping to do is um, have a discussion, not, not really a presentation, but more of a roundtable discussion about kind of two problems I'm concerned about. We've discussed this some in the past, but um, I wanted. I thought this would be a good venue for us to kind of chat about it a little bit more. Um, my goal is to have a lot of discussion. It's likely not something we'll be able to resolve here, but if we can all come away with a better understanding of the problem and brainstorm possible solutions and share with others, um, and maybe have an idea or two that we think might solve one or both of these problems, that would probably be the best case. Uh, this time we'll go to um, the 50 minutes after the hour, so we have about 45 minutes. Um, my claim is that even with our back, and this is line eight on the agenda, even with our back, Pulp is not multi-user safe in two specific ways. One of them is uh, problem one, and this is the, the more serious of the two problems. Content itself is not safe. So uh, as you know, the kind of description of the problem is lines 12, 13, and 14. I'll kind of paraphrase it here, but if you have two users, Alice and Eve, um, Alice has secret content like putting GPG keys into an RPM that uh, Alice is going to distribute to her systems using that uh, RPM's installation. And uh, they up, Alice uploads that um, RPM to Pulp to, so Pulp can store it. Um, and it has some never, whatever that never is that Alice has chosen which is Alice built it. Then Eve comes along and falsifies uh, an RPM with the same never and uploads it to Pulp um, or, uh, or creates a falsified repo that contains that RPM and syncs from that repo. Uh, Pulp, because it's a big deduplicating machine, is going to recognize that as already um, present. Uh, and it's going to use the, it's going to hand over into a repository that Eve controls the RPM that Alice wanted to keep secret and protect and contains Alice's sen uh, sensitive credentials. Um, so the theme here is content isn't safe. And uh, I just Brian, want to also, mm -hmm, yes. In that case, wouldn't the, the falsified RPM have to have like the same checksum and size as the, as Alice's RPM? I'm seeing some heads nod yes and some nod no. I think so. <clears throat> so even even in that case, though, now what's happened is um, I pushed a Nevra with a checksum and a size in order to prevent Alice from pushing hers because mine already exists, even though we're two different people and we should our content shouldn't be shared. Once you'd I have to other, push it. That problem is the same. You'd have to push it to the same repo, though, which I think is maybe not the case that we're trying to cover here. Well, no, not necessarily the same repo. Um, to the same pulp instance. The same instance. No, I can I can push two different RPMs with the same Nevra with different checksums to the same pulp instance. Oh, that's right. That's right. As long as yeah. There may be other content types that uh, this is a problem with Brian. Um, absolutely, like I don't know. Ansible collections or something, but I, I think the RPM use case maybe is not actually correct. Um, well, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I don't know what type of a SHA those checksums use. Is it SHA-256? Well, well, the reason I ask is because if it's SHA-256, then I pretty much totally agree with you in terms of that being an attack vector. But if it's SHA-1, then um, that's easy to compromise. And I'm, I'm just unsure of it. Um, Some old con the... might have it, show one. Some older content, yeah. Um, what I was also thinking about is our artifact storage. And <clears throat> we, I don't know, what do we match artifacts on? SHA-256? Yeah. Yes. SHA-256. Uh, SHA yeah. 
Yeah, and if you can produce, if you're showing up with the exact same artifact, then Pulp isn't um, providing you anything you don't already know. Um, so I feel pretty safe in that area. Um, so I think I mean, uh, in there, I think uh, at the moment when you know the shard of something, you can get the artifact. You can retrieve information that you're not supposed to know. Not if there's content protection enabled. Okay. You would have to. I think another example would be when you upload an RPM, like Alice will upload an RPM, and then Bob will try to upload same RPM. And because Pulp tries to deduplicate, it will look that there is already such RPM available. Uh, so I think this is something similar to what Mihai was bringing up with the container blobs, like layers, that uh, I will Bob will fake that he wants to upload RPM, but he actually doesn't have the bits, and Pop will say, oh, I already have this RPM. I don't know if someone else can phrase it better, but basically... I mean, that's exactly what Brian was mm -hmm. describing. Yeah, that's effectively the concern. Um, okay. Um, and Justin, your point's very well made, and I, I just want to double down on that. Um, the concern is that if not in this specific example, there will be others, other content types, um, Ansible collections for sure, file content, um, uh, because the 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 whatever is the uniqueness constraint on content can be falsified by anyone. Uh, to artificially show up with what looks like that same content elsewhere. Oh, wait, they don't actually have the binary data. And what Pulp does is it gives them the binary data. And so um, that's that's one of the concerns. Um, this actually came in the form of several CVEs. So this is a little bit more than theoretical um, against Pulp 2. Um, those CVEs were addressed in various ways that's kind of beyond the scope of this conversation, but that's um, trying to speak to how theoretical is this problem. And I should say it's more than, it's more than theoretical. Um, and it, it specifically comes into play when we have a multi-user pulp system. So the second problem, because I want to try to discuss some of the solutions and hear what you all think. Second problem is object natural key uniqueness. So Alice creates a repo named CentOS 8, uh, user, uh, Eve wants to create a repo named CentOS 8, but cannot because it's already taken um, as a natural key. And uh, now there are hundreds or thousands of users, and uh, the names get very strange very fast, um, which is not really a safety concern, but it, I claim or that it's pretty annoying. Um, I see written some, yeah, that, some things on line 25. I added that actually speaking as an ex-security guy, that is a security concern because it means I can find out the names of all of Alice's repos by simply trying to create repos and noting which ones fail. And that's a side channel and I can gather information. Like if Alice is dumb and names her repos with like people's names or department names or phone numbers or God only knows what, you're leaking somebody else's information to a random script. Um, and I have actually worked on projects where that problem was a sev one. Oh my God, stop the presses. We have to stop doing that. Um, so you yeah, can't, so when we think about this, the multi-user thing is if, if Alice and Eve both work for the same company and that happens, then Eve goes and yells at Alice and says, you took my name. And that, that is a problem, but it's the minor one. But if we're different companies, the fact that I can issue an API call and find out things that are already used by somebody not in my company is a security problem. And that's where this, that's so I should, I need to be able to say, I want to create one named CentOS and it should come back and go, you are the only person in your org that wants to use that name. You get to have a repo with that name, even though there's a thousand other CentOS 8s in the pulp instance. I don't know that. That's the multi-tenant problem as opposed to the multi-user problem. Yeah. So um, thank you for saying that. Um, it's uh, it's a concern. It's not one that I would lose sleep over, but it is definitely a problem. Um, and so these issues kind of both go together because they um, speak to Pulp's 
uh, not being a multi-tenant system, not being multi-tenant safe. And so uh, this is kind of where my prepared content generally ends. And we can have a discussion about what we could or couldn't do about these. Um, just as little starters, uh, I have looked into the Django community and I've looked into the Postgres community and I've um, pasted here links to what they recommend for these types of situations. And um, the first is a Django solution, which uses the sites framework. Um, the idea here is that uh, there is um, there is this concept called a site, and really in Django land it came from websites. Whereas you would have content, you'd be running the same web sites feature set on multiple web properties. So each web property would become its own site in the sites framework. And then if you have users on property A and users on property B, those users never mix because when the request comes in, it knows, oh, I'm on web property A and all the ORM calls from that point on, and in our case, all the way back, all in the tasking systems, know ah, this is all for web property A. And the sites framework lets you query set chain on this extra, this um, extra piece of data, which um, Django provides and allows you to kind of create and manage sites and associate one or more objects with the current site that is in use for that request. Um, so that's the sites framework. Any, any quite, let's have some discussion about that. Any, has anyone used this before? What do y'all think about this? Does this require um, having actually separate domain? Even no. if it's just subdomains? No, it does not actually, it doesn't actually work with domains at all. You can set the site um, aspect in a variety of ways, one of which could be done um, as part of the inbound middleware. So Brian, I'm looking at the, uh, the document you've linked here and the way this gets implemented looks to me like the, that you're at, at the model level, the models where you want to take advantage of this know which site they belong to. It's a, it's a field on each of the models. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's because we've we like again we've this is um, the way that old old sat did did multi org, and I'm, which is not necessarily a bad thing. This is just the way the yeah. way that it worked was that every object belonged to an org, which which is also a company or a site in this context, and had a foreign key that told you know this particular row in the database belongs to this org, and so if I'm logged in, I have an org. And nothing is, there's nothing in the app that lets me see anything that doesn't match my work. Yeah, I mean, exactly, Grant. That's the, that's the paradigm. That's the architecture. Okay, cool. And it's, yep. it's not unlike if we had just done the same thing, only DIY'd it and didn't use the Django built-in facilities. Every, uh, every object is a member of exactly one site. Yep, exactly. So okay. it's essentially Sorry. namespacing. It's namespacing. That's exactly yeah. what it is. It's namespacing. Yeah, it's, uh, that you could even have multiple users in the same site. So it would yes. Kind of separate the tenancy from the multi-user problem. Exactly right. And RBAC, RBAC yeah. is based on the users logged in, but data access would be based on the site is the way that we've yeah. done it before. But yeah, exactly. You decide on the site, and that would, again, be the user, right? Yeah, you can you could uh, you could use the sites framework differently. You could uh, on one deployment, you know, it doesn't have to be the same for all deployments, but um, you could make every user a site, and this would provide user level isolation a hundred percent. Sure. Or you could make everything uh, exactly one site in the whole installation. This effectively yep. disables the sitiness. Or you could do subsets, some number of sites. You can imagine computer science department, social science department, yep. accounting department, and each one of those being uh, a site. Um, yep. So and anywhere, everywhere in between, from a from a capabilities perspective. Yep. But one user can only be in one site. With this That's where it gets interesting. 
I hope we don't do that because that was an anti-pattern for old RHN because it thought that, oh, a, a site is the important thing. It's a company and a user belongs to a company okay. and and always belongs to that company. And it, it, there's a whole discussion to be had about what happens when a human being moves from one to another. Oh, my God, that's great. I love it, especially for these discussions. We all need helmets. Um, <laughs> There's a whole discussion to be had, Matthias, along the lines of trying to get your data model to recognize that human beings move from company to company. And are they allowed to carry the stuff that they made with them or not? And what happens when they don't get to? It's still in your company. Somebody gets to own that. There's a whole raft of problems involved in that. And as long as we don't blindly step into the minefield without recognizing it, I'm sure we can come up there. I mean, there's answers out there. It's just we have a lot of anti-pattern experience of how to do it. I'd rather avoid those if we can. Right. And even when they're not switching companies, they're still switching uh, teams and divisions within the same company. Yeah. That happens. They regularly want to keep the account. But yep. And if you if you cite by organization, then that gets interesting. Yeah. Right. Um, we, we, have, we, have, we have done we have solved this problem by having two kinds of sites, sites that were companies where there was an admin that got to create sub users and sites that were just the user. So I would have my own personal site and I could only I couldn't create sub users and I owned all the stuff. Um, but as Brian points out, you can build all of that on the kind of framework that we're talking about here. Right. At that point, it's a question of how do you implement the sites? and um, uh, ac control access to them once you have the site field in every model. There's a lot of things you can do is what I'm hearing. And mm -hmm. I will add, I've seen this multiple times. Um, users say, oh, I, you know, I want multi-tenancy, you know, I, I need it. And you give it to them and they say, oh, this is awesome, this is amazing. Now I want to share things yep. between my, my sites, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you're like, oh, I just did all this work to make it multi-tenant. Now you want to break down the walls. Um, and that's not necessarily something you have to solve, you know, immediately. But I would just say expect that request. Yes. Yeah. And be prepared to answer it with no. <laughs> I think we should have at least one solution to the problem that is you install one instance for every tenant. Which is today's, yes. that's today's solution right now is multi-tenancy is you're on a separate machine with a separate instance of pulp in its own database. Right, and that's 100% separation. Yes. Yeah, those are air gap systems. And I think that the um, the big downside to that is well, you have to manage and set up a bunch of things. You have to yep. upgrade a bunch of things independently. Um, and just calling these out because the reality is it's not it's not a terrible situation actually. Um, but uh, probably the biggest um, downside of what we would do today, air gapped independent installations, is um, the much duplication of artifact file system mm -hmm. storage. That's a big one. So like if you tried to run Rui this way. Um, or some other large user this way, you would be duplicate for every extra entity that you want to provide isolation for, you now have to duplicate your entire file system. And that's the main thing to try to avoid. Yeah, I was going to ask if artifacts would also be multi-tenant or would be shared. Um, I think because some of the cases that you're talking about where if I'm an attacker and let's say I do know the checksum of that uh, secret RPM, is, is that a use case for trying, trying to protect against? Because I could imagine I if so. I can create a repo upstream that doesn't actually have the RPM and then sync it with on demand and cause pulp to think, oh, hey, I already know about this RPM. Uh, so I'm just going to associate the existing one. You know, no, I, th I think what it would do in that case, or what I hope that it would do in that case. Thank you for calling out the example. Uh, what I hope it would do is, uh, when this, when it looks into pulp during the sync, it will see, oh, this site, this user member of this site 
has no content. And even though uh, Pulp has a bunch of content in it, the isolation provided is telling the database queries or responding saying, oh, no, no, there is no, there is no content here. But then the sync will fetch, assuming that the, sh the artifact is real, um, then they will fetch that artifact and they will then try to place it into the content addressable file system backend of Pulp. And since they are SHA-256 the same, they are the same and Pulp will be able to provide deduplication at that point. And from that moment on, the user's like, oh, I got what I needed. And the bid administrator's like, cool, everyone thinks they got more, but actually they didn't pay, we don't pay any more in storage. So the administrator's like, cool, I got what I needed. And there's no security exposure there in that scenario because for the attacker, for Eve to be able to make that happen, they have to have had access to a repo that has the RPM with the checksum in it. And they could have just skipped pulp and just downloaded it directly by doing a DNF install. So they're not, the pulp instance isn't, isn't exposing anything at that, at that point. Is it? Uh, That's my understanding. It's I, okay. And I'm trying to think like the bad guys and it's been a long time since I've done that. <laughs> there's a pulp instance, the pulp instance is allowed access to that repo, but I am not because I don't have the SAT certificate, for example, but I am allowed to create stuff in that pulp instance. So I tell pulp, hey, I want to have a repo named this. And pulp says, okay. And I say, hey, I want you to use this as the remote. And pulp says, I know how to find that remote. And I don't think that works because I think already at that point, you have to have, once our back is in place, you have to have access to the keys to the repo that you're telling pulp you want to sync for you i think the user does or at least what can I mean? be made for that to happen i think there's there's definitely discussion about this but i think the between our back and the discussion about site the tools are there to close the security holes that i'm groping for here uh, what i heard is that you can fake an upstream repository that's supposed to contain certain sha checksums right and not the actual files and then you do a sync Content from there names. and pulp says oh no i know this artifact i don't know i don't need to download it again no yeah, no no the idea is that it would, that it would like, download it again to yeah list to <laughs> say this user has access to this artifact in the database because it's on demand i don't actually look for the file like well uh, actually uh let me say something real quick right i think the difference you made is Artifacts are different than artifact storage. And so artifacts are not shared. Artifact storage is shared. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that might actually be a, a, a solution if we kind of uh, separate the artifact storage from pulp and make it shareable between pulp instances, then the multi tenancy can again be several pulp instances sharing one artifact storage. Yeah, and that's that's a possible option too, but we are then left with a lingering set of problems that I think are not as great in terms of user experience outcomes. Like for example, you'll have to manage multiple mm -hmm. independent isolated deployments. You'll have to upgrade each one independently. Um, you'll have to um, configure all of them independently and that's that's kind of the beauty of actually vent of of baking in this sites framework directly into pulp itself yeah if you if i put my hat on matthias as the admin of i will take the the horrific at the end of the spectrum example rackspace and they have thousands of customers all of whom want rel let's say um and they want to have a couple of admins that go to one control panel and configure, you know, somebody I call in and say, here's my credit card, give me an account. And now I want to have, I want to have rel access. They want to be able to set all that up from one place, as opposed to having to spin up a whole new instance for me. They, it's all in one, in one spot. And um, when somebody calls in and says it's broken, they don't have to figure out which, which interface am I going to look at? I'm going to look at the global interface and say for this site, what's the problem, as opposed to having to find the, the specific machine that has a problem. So if you put, if you put on the, the helmet 
of uh, the helmet of I am providing a service to a lot of people that are giving me money, none of whom are allowed to know about the other people that are giving me money. Um, there's a whole bunch of use cases that fall out of that. And the site stuff is necessary for it. I think the lockless work is necessary for it because at that point you're talking about a level of scale in one instance that is going to get exciting. Um, so we need both of those, but I think they're they're incredibly powerful and they match. Dennis, you're killing me here. <laughs> they they match real world use cases, and I need to shut up now because that's just too damn funny. <laughs> It's the only hat that's not packed. <laughs> you look stunning. I just got to say, it's you. Yeah, so um, with, with the sites thing, uh, I believe that it's the Django built-in way to provide isolation. I think that the problem statements up at the top are pretty motivating in terms of the need for isolation. And so I believe this is on the viable list. Um, and, you know, when and when and who, I think is not something I'm necessarily trying to put a timeline to right now. But um, whenever this does become the most important next step, I think uh, a prototype um, would be the way. Um, basically at enable the sites framework and take our objects and uh, the stages API also and have them work with, have the sites object set at incoming call request time, have the sites object preserved through to task runtime mm -hmm. and have the query sets return um, data appropriately. Limited, limited by site, yeah. Yep. I think there's a lot of um, possibilities here. One question I had is, I mean, for true multi-tenancy distribution paths mm -hmm. could conflict, which would mean that maybe they would have to exist at different paths. Like meaning all of my distributions would be prefixed with site name or whatever. Is is yeah. that is that kind of the direction you're y'all are thinking? I mean, that's definitely an option. Um, and we could have, uh, yeah, that's definitely an option. And we could actually have maybe even our back um, help provide the at call request time verification around the, the creation and modification of the distribution URLs to, to basically cause um, all the URL layouts to adhere to the, uh, the idea that you had just shared which is that their site ID is contained in the, uh, all distribution URLs are namespaced by site ID. And you can, can do whatever you want for your site within your site's ID's distribu distribution URL namespace, but not others. Um, we could also do it in the middleware, um, just generally as well. Um, but from an ideas, regardless of how it's done, from an ideas perspective, I think that's very legit. The other option um, is to, actually use in different independent web properties um, and have them uh, be run as one big pulp deployment with one database. So it's really one installation still, but have each site be a server block that has a different name. And so it would be like pulp. Uh, or csc.pulp.example.com and literature pulp.example.com. And then when the Nginx routes those things in, it's passing the site ID that needs to be set along with each one. And in that case, you don't need to provide any special distribution URL namespacing. Um, we may need, may need to revise our conflicting checking code a little bit, but um, you basically you're avoiding the problem because the host name would be server name multiplex. That's another fine example uh, option too. And then you go to different content directories at the Nginx level, for example. It would say gigany.pulp.com goes to, I don't know, var www slash gigany slash whatever. That's not visible from the out from uh, 
the URL. I can make my URLs whatever I want, but the engine is deciding what content to deliver at that point. I don't think yeah. I said that right, but you does that? Do you well, it would pass. Well, in effect, I mean, yeah, it would pass. I think the idea is it would pass the site ID back to the back end, and the back end yeah. can take it from there. Oh, do the right thing. And the exactly. trick is, yeah, exactly, and do the right thing. So it's not as tied to the file system as perhaps your example is, but yeah, that's 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 an idea. Okay. Okay. Um, I also want to try to talk a little bit about the Postgres option, which is basically the same thing, only with a different mechanism. Um, but before we go on, do, are there other thoughts or ideas or concerns along with this type of a thing? All right. The only well, thought I have is, Matthias, I think you're muted. Um, I don't know if you're trying to speak, but. We are doing namespace. We are adding namespacing to the container plugin already, and the exact thing that uh, Justin brought up with the relative paths, we're already hitting. Where basically that namespace is now going to be, even though we're going to have a namespace object that's going to be, you know, a foreign key to other things, we're still uh, having to update the base path of the distributions to contain that namespace in it. Mm -hmm. So that uh, content uh, served by the content app is namespaced in the URL, and so we're uh, whenever we introduce uh, this feature uh, that we're discussing now, we will need to address it right away. How mm -hmm. the content app is going to handle the namespacing. I agree. Yeah, and that's good point with containers because like satellite contains namespacing or multi-tenancy already or Catello Foreman. Um, but a single registry URL or a single registry doesn't support that. So a user users are expected to write their Docker files pointing to, you know, slash my base image. Uh, because that works against Docker Hub, and then they want to sync down that that repo and use the same Docker file against the registry that Pulp is is hosting, and that doesn't work with multi tenancy very well. Yeah. I don't think I've actually understood what you said. Yeah. So. The, the, the common problem in satellite today or Catella today is I have my Docker file and it's the, its base layer is some great app, right? If I sync down some great app from Docker Hub, I can have one instance of some great app and I can Docker pull from the pulp registry at some my some great great app. I can Docker build against some great app. But as soon as I need another instance of some great some great app, it is now a different repo path. So it's now some great path two. And now I have to update my Docker files to account for that. And in in Catello it's not just at the org level, it's also at the lifecycle environment level that this problem exists. So I, basically, I have to update my Docker files for uh, multi-tenancy or for multi-lifecycle environments. And if if you used <clears throat> domain names or subdomains to handle this, I think it would work perfectly. Um, it's just uh, it that puts kind of the onerous on the user to have multiple subdomains in their installation. Um, I think it's a it's a great solution. It's just maybe not a great solution that everybody can can use. So Justin, what you're the flip the other side of that is that somehow I have a Docker file that says I get my thing from registry slash the container. And that works when I'm in dev. And what I really want is for that exact same URL to work when I'm in the QA workflow that you've just described, but magic happens and somehow I'm now getting a different container than the one that was named that yeah. in the dev environment. Yeah. Basically, uh, the, the way the Docker clients work is that you can um, 
reuse the names, but uh, tell it to use a different host name. And this is why Justin right. is saying that using uh, host names to do the Citing. separation is going to, for the Docker case, would work a lot better. Than have it in the URL. and that, But that was one of the things that, uh, you know, that I was kind of groping for with the, do we solve this at the Nginx level, which is you would change your host name, the app, it's still, the, you know, my container, but the the host that you're using to get it from pulp is is dev001.mine.pulp.whatever. And then it's it's qa001.mine.whatever to get them. And that'll get you a different one because it would be happening. They would be essentially virtual hosts in the pulp instance, in the single pulp instance. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It sounds like virtual hosts yeah. would make this a lot easier than and, uh, namespacing URLs. I mean, we still have to have the, the underlying site stuff that we've talked about here. That still has to be in place. It's a question of there's a few specific areas where we might want to make it possible for a user to to get things without them having to explicitly put in their site. Because the engine knows. We would know. Pulp would know. Oh, your site X. Making the user put that X into their URLs feels feels wrong because the user's like, why do you keep asking me for this? I already you already know it. Why are you making me put it in here? Right. And there's it feels like there's a way there are ways to make that happen magically and usefully to the user while preserving the site, the the multi-tenancy uh, in a useful way. I feel I'm I feel like I'm there's a there's a gap between where I'm standing and what I can almost see in the mist somewhere over there. Well, content no, guard. I, I feel like that would work. Yeah. So content guards uh, provide some of this, right? Um, they. Wow, it's a lion. It really is a lion. <laughs> um, uh, right now, uh, for RPM content, uh, the certificate has the path in it and mm. it's still the user providing that path. Right. Um, and I could see uh, situations where that certificate wouldn't necessarily have a path encoded in it. The system would just know that this certificate belongs to these paths. Right. CertGuard is definitely a place where we'd have to think about what the exposed experience was. Um, okay. Yeah. But again, so, <laughs> so part of, um, so it sounds like after discussion, we've had some, uh, things that we should be thinking about definitely, um, particularly how we expose or don't expose this namespace, um, value in attributes or in URLs. Um, but, uh, and I'm also perceiving that it would be, uh, there's no disagreement about it being a useful needed feature for pulp, not with any claim about when exactly. Um, and so we can uh, make a proposal some other day in terms of like uh, an actual plan um, and probably a maybe a little special interest, interest group or something like that to um, try to put a actual proposal together and perhaps produce some sort of short prototype. Um, if we had come here and it was like, oh, there's this hard problem and this hard problem and there's do, what you don't know is about this hard problem and we would not have a next step like that. We would have a next step that was basically like we're screwed. Um, so I'm satisfied with that. I mean, like that's about as much as I was hoping to discuss to share the problem and then kind of set the table for what are our possible solutions and look down the road a little bit for some possible gotchas. And we have a few of those as well. So that's good. And then which release do you foresee these changes to be applied? I don't actually have a specific one. Um, to me, the question is just to just adjust it a little bit. What work is more important than this work? And I think our backing all the things is more important. I think the migration plugin 
and getting our the pulp two to pulp three user base just generally upgraded is more important. And I see the CLI as likely more important as well. Um, I can't think of many other things. I mean, right now, if somebody said to me, Grant, how does pulp handle multi-tenant without making me duplicate everything on disk, my answer would be, you have multiple pulp instances that share a file system where all the artifacts go, which is basically how Rui, for example, does things. Um, it's it's suboptimal, and from an administrator, they're upset when they're like, well, what if I want thousands of users? And my answer is then, then you're going to have to wait for another instance of pulp to come around. But right now, we could solve this problem grossly with a gigantic sledgehammer of Matthias's thing about multi-instance is multi-tenant, largely. Um, yep. So we have an answer. Yep. It's just one nobody's happy with, but it's it'll work. Um, so I don't feel like this is a this is a stop the presses level problem. If I agree. Zero an if we had zero answer, then we would have to talk because this is a really this is a real world use case. Um, but it does need to be something we talk about and solve soon. Maybe not till pulp four, but it needs to be solved because this is really useful to people that that want to use pulp at scale. This is a very useful concept. Yeah, I mean, if we think about a very large deployment using Pulp, like if um, the the a site that was as, had as large a user base as like Docker or Artifactory, for example, were to be using a technology like Pulp, I think this would be an absolute must. Um, and so that's a that's a goal to grow into, but one that um, I, I think is consistent with our other goals of growing the user base significantly. So we'll talk more about that at community sessions as well. Um, I just want to call out line 35. I don't think we are going to go through it very much here. Um, but if you're interested, you can check it out. Uh, it's basically just like the sites framework, only instead of having database uh, letting the Django ORM configure out, uh, configure and figure out what objects a particular user who's a member of a site should be able to see. Um, it uses, it does it actually at the row level itself in the database. Um, it has been around for a while. This is not a new feature of Postgres. It is a very well-known feature of Postgres. And it is one that we could use. And that actually looks to me pretty awesome. But from a high level, it it's just, the same. It requires a different database user for every site, essentially, right? Yeah. Uh, I think it requires a context. Does it? It looks like, I mean, I'm yeah. just looking at the document for eight seconds. It looks like user, but. Yep. And so you have a dynamic Django config. Uh, you connect to it with your default, and then you you switch the user to that user. Mm, I got you. Yep. Yeah. And that's pretty great because literally you can just move it all into the database. Like, who's handling yeah. all this? Postgres is handling all this. Well, and the other nice thing is it means that you don't have to worry about, for example, you've got a hole in your ORM somewhere where you forgot to check for site because the database exactly. doesn't let you forget. There's a, there's a Again, the ex-security yep. guy in me is much happier with, you just can't get there from here if we can make that happen. Interesting. Yeah. And so implementation-wise, yeah, I'm I'm more interested in the RLS option. Um, but conceptually speaking, they're about the same. So uh, we have about three minutes. Um, and so I guess last calls for um, thoughts and comments, concerns. Can you hear me well? Yes, can, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Tanya, it's hard. The rushing wind going by your head is making it hard to hear you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I wanted to ask Brian if it makes sense to maybe start a thread or send email to mailing list um, if people have other ideas. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. 
and one that I would like to like to do. Yeah. I don't know when, but one that I would like to do. Now it would look more like um, these first two problem statements, only with a proposal underneath it, like a concrete one. Like here's how we'll here's how we'll handle this problem that we talked about here, and here's how we'll use real level security. Here's where it'll be set here and there, mm -hmm. and everywhere. A loose plan for us to 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 redo yeah. together. Yeah. All right. Um, that's thank you all for joining. Thank you all for the discussion. And uh, I'm going to click the stop button now, if that's all right with you all.